you're in a, a multiple relationship is one in which you're in a professional role and then in another role with the same person at the same time. It can be another professional role, it can be a social or a romantic role. Uh, so that's how they define what a multiple relationship is. Number three uh, tends to uh, include, uh, let's terminate therapy so we can go have and have a date. Uh, that's promising to enter into another relationship in the future. Uh, but notice the code also broadens a multiple relationship to be defined as being in a relationship with a person closely associated with or related to that person. So a uh, multiple relationship can occur if you're in a professional role with a child, the child is your patient, uh, and you then have a business relationship with the parent or a social relationship with the parent, or a romantic relationship with the parent. Uh, now, the, the operative part is that a psychologist refrains from entering into a re multiple relationship if the multiple relationship could reasonably, there's the reasonably, uh, be expected to impair the psychologist's objectivity, competence or effectiveness in performing his or her functions as a psychologist or otherwise risks exploitation or harm to the person um, with whom the professional relationship exists. Multiple relationships that would not reasonably be expected to cause impairment or risk exploitation or harm are not unethical. So we'll, we're going to look at the other codes of ethics as well, uh, but this begins to point out at least from uh, the psychologist's perspective, that not all multiple relationships are unethical. They have to impair objectivity, they have to impair effectiveness, uh, they have to be exploitative and cause harm. Uh, there is a correlated uh, provision 306 which is called conflict of interest and says you refrain from taking on a professional role when personal, scientific, professional, legal, financial, or other interests or relationships could reasonably be expected to impair their objectivity, competence, or effectiveness, or expose the person or organization uh, to harm or exploitation. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is closely related. You shouldn't, if there's going to be a conflict of interest between your, prof your professional role uh, and uh, uh, when you have competing interests with regard to that client. I'm going to give you an example of that in a little bit. Uh, then that's also a violation of the code of, of ethics. Uh, now, I haven't included in the materials the, the basic ones. You can't have sex with your clients. I mean, I think we all kind of agree on that. Uh, but that, is, that does define a multiple relationship. Uh, but I am including uh, 1006 and 1008. 1006 says uh, that you don't engage in sexual uh, intimacies with clients that they know to be close relatives, guardians, or significant others. So again, uh, what they're talking about here is uh, if you have a client in therapy, let's say marriage uh, therapy, uh, a woman, uh, you can't have sex with the husband. Uh, that, that should be pretty obvious, but uh, the, the code makes that clear. And then uh, 1008 uh, is probably uh, the, the, the most controversial one. Uh, this says that you can't have uh, sexual intimacies with former clients uh, for at least two years after termination of therapy. Uh, and this, is, this provision is a good example of of the reality that codes of ethics are the result of political compromises. Because if you went to the, uh, went to the, the debates uh, of the legislative body of these professional associations discussing can you have sex with former clients, there's a wide variety of opinions. For example, some people believe that uh, you should never have a sexual relationship with a former client. And once a client, always a client. Uh, and so therefore, uh, uh, ethically, you should be forbidden from having uh, a sexual relationship with a former, no matter even if it occurs 20 years later, uh, because there's always the possibility that the client will return. And in fact, there are some state regulations. I know Florida, for example, has a regulation that says that uh, you can never have sex with a former client. 
so it becomes a licensure issue. Uh, but uh, there, and then there are other people who believe that <coughs> uh, you should be able to uh, uh, have a sexual relationship as soon as you terminate, as long as it's not a fraudulent termination. Uh, uh, and that uh, to say that you can't means that you're violating the principle of autonomy. If the two people decide, listen, uh, here are the pros, here are the cons, should we, have it, should we go out on dates, should we do this now that therapy is over, as long as you discuss it and the fact that you can't return to therapy and everybody agrees and there's informed consent, then we'll go out and, and have a romantic relationship. Uh, so we have the people who say never and how would people say uh, it interferes with autonomy and, and self-determination and we shouldn't be treating our patients like they can't make decisions on their own and they're powerless to make these decisions. So what we have is a compromise of two years. But even after two years, the burden, as you can see from the uh, code, uh, says that the burden is on the, on the the psychologist to show uh, a number of things. Uh, how long has it been since ter therapy terminated? Uh, what kind of therapy was it? There might be a diff difference between cognitive behavior therapy and four days a week psychoanalytically oriented therapy. Uh, what's the current patient's mental status? Uh, uh, are they psychotic and you take it out mentally retarded and you're taking advantage of them? Uh, what's the likelihood of adverse impact? Uh, what did you say during therapy? Uh, did you suggest or invite the possibility of this? All of those things are taken into account. Uh, uh, but uh, it's in the sexual area that the APA, I, I know from personal experience, because as general counsel, I sat in on every ethics committee meeting and uh, 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 ran the hearings that uh, psychologists uh, uh, used to appeal their expulsions. Uh, and they take this very seriously. I'll give you uh, one quick example. Uh, as the ethics committee of the APA expelled a, a male psychologist for having sex with his current client. Uh, and under the rules, if you, the recommendation is for expulsion, you can have a hearing before, a live hearing before three panel uh, person uh, independent of the ethics committee who will review and their, their decision is final. And you can bring in witnesses. So he brought in the patient. Uh, and she said, I'm now married to this guy. Leave us alone. Don't bother with us. Yes, we did have sex, but I'm, I wasn't harmed. I'm, I'm happy and we're happily married. Don't expel my husband from the APA. Uh, the appeals committee upheld the expulsion, even under these circumstances. So uh, the, the, these things are very strictly construed, at least from the APA's perspective. Uh, all right, let's take a look at uh, the the Ameri 